Greetings from Tales from SYL Ranch, news and commentary from the heartland. And I'm your host, Bill Stone. I want to come to you today to talk about something that was driven home for me fairly recently, within the last 24 hours, really. I've been kicking around doing a video like this, but uh, I had an impetus to actually do it this time. It is my contention that social media may be, on the whole, a bad thing. In fact, it's my contention that social media is, in fact, destroying civilization. Now, what I mean by that is maybe not what it sounds like on the top. I don't mean that social media is sending us back into some sort of dark age, although in some respects it is doing that. What I mean is that social media is m destroying our ability to be civil to one another. That is, to have civil discourse, you know, reasoned civil discourse with one person to another. Now, back when I was a young man and uh, growing up, the way that you usually communicated with people was they were your friends or they were people that you knew by virtue of you know living next door to them and talking to them over the backyard fence or they were people that maybe didn't know all that well friends of friends that might come over and watch a football game on saturday afternoons with you and so when you discussed things like politics like religion it was not an existential conversation. That is, it was not something where if you disagreed with the other person, that meant that they had to be destroyed, that they were a threat to your very existence. Social media has changed that. And that's because in social media, what's happening is you are not responding to an individual. You're not responding to a human being that you can see, that you can see what their reactions are, that you can get back and forth from, that you can question each other about various things. You're posting your side of things, they post their side of things, and if they don't completely match up, there is no room whatsoever for there to be any common ground. There is no common ground to be had, and that's because you don't have to care about the other person. At the end of the day, when you're dealing with social media, or anything online for that matter, the person that you're talking about is not a person. It is a faceless bunch of words. And I learned this a long time ago because I was lucky enough to be in IT for about 40 years, most of it at the bleeding edge of the Internet. As the Internet grew in the 1990s to what it is today, I was there for that, and I got to help push some of that along. And so it occurred to me a long time ago, that for the most part, the people that I was dealing with, whose words I were using to judge them, and who were judging me based on my words, were simply that, words on the screen. They were not people, per se. They were words on a screen. And I also recognized that to some extent, when people are posting something on social media or anywhere else, you're seeing something of a persona. Even here on YouTube, what I'm doing right now, I am to some extent pushing a persona. It's why you see me wearing this costume. It's why you see this green screen behind me of what looks like a busy newsroom. Because trust me, there's nothing behind me but a green screen. It's just green back there. I'm putting in a busy newsroom because I want to push a certain type of brand. I want to push a certain type of persona. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm acting. I was going to make that very, very clear. I am not acting. When I'm telling you my opinions, they're coming usually straight off the top of my head. I very rarely script these out. I have some notion about what I'm going to say. But the opinions that you're hearing are my own opinions. They're what I have to say about a given subject. They're not me acting. This is different from many YouTubers. I'm told, and you can see other YouTubers who have been surprised by this when they've gone to conventions that involve YouTubers, that many YouTubers, a lot of the successful ones that you know, are just acting they are not really believing the things they are saying. They are playing to an audience that they know will get them subs and likes and views. They're not necessarily people that they pretend to be. I am the person that you see before you, for the most part, with the exception of I am pushing this persona. However, what you see in front of you is not exactly who I am. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to hopefully lots and lots of people who 
tens of thousands, perhaps I'll be up to PewDiePie status someday, and I will be uh, speaking to millions of people. But if you took me offline, if you got rid of the costume, put me in a t-shirt and jeans, what you're going to find is that I'm not quite the same. There's going to be a lot more back and forth. It's going to be a lot more listening. And if you're talking to me as a human being, I'm not just going to be giving out my opinion. I'm going to be giving out my opinion. I'm going to hear yours back, and that'll alter maybe some of what I think or how I'm going to deal with you. And the reason it, for this is real simple. I'm dealing with a real human being there. When you talk about social media, you're no longer dealing with real human beings. You're dealing with words on a screen. You do not any longer think of the person that you are typing at as a human being. You think of them as someone who has a serious, massive disagreement with you that may be, in fact, what you think of as an existential disagreement. That is, what they believe is so foreign to what your own beliefs are that they must be suppressed or perhaps even killed for holding those views. We see this constantly in modern politics. Social media is destroying civility. It is destroying that civilization. It is destroying civility because we don't have to care about the other person that we're talking to. We just read their words, make assumptions about who they are as people, and we're wrong. We're always wrong. The person on the other side of that screen is a human being with their own strengths, their own weaknesses, their own personality traits that you will never see as part of what they write. What they write, what a person writes on that screen, is not who they really are. When you're sitting down to write a social media post, think about it for a moment. Just think. Is the person that you are portraying in that post who you really are? Does it represent you personally as an individual? And I think you'll find most of the time it doesn't. It is you holding forth an opinion, but the opinion is something that you deeply hold. And any time that you see somebody else who has a differing opinion, it becomes an existential issue. It's something that must be ended. The other person must be stopped or convinced at the very least that you are right so that your person doesn't feel like it is threatened with its own existence. In reality, we have a lot more common ground than you might think. Now, in the past, when I was a young man, when I was first growing up, we had to care about the other person because the way that we interacted primarily was personally, face to face. We would see each other face to face. We would be able to get to know the other person and know them as people so that when they came up with some kind of opinion that we disagreed with, there would be back and forth. They would say something. I would say something. Maybe we'd find there's some common ground in there. But that's because we had to deal with each other as individuals, as people. Online is not people. It is what they write. And that is not the same thing as the person. For you, when you're writing to somebody online, what you're writing to is some opinion they've given. And in Twitter, it's horrible. You cannot, you cannot, absolutely cannot form a coherent thought on Twitter in the limited amount of characters that you have. If you start judging people as human beings based on what you see on Twitter, you're going to be 100% completely wrong. It's not much better on Facebook or other social media because what you're looking at there, again, is words on a screen that are associated maybe with somebody's profile picture. But that doesn't mean that you know them. It doesn't mean that you know who they are. It just means you know what they've written. And what they've written... Well, it may be brilliant, it may be stupid, it may be something you, would, you agree or disagree with, but that doesn't mean that they are bad people. Just because someone holds an opposing view to yours, at least on the surface, doesn't mean that they're bad people. And that is why social media is destroying civilization. It is destroying our ability to be civil because we no longer need to care about the other person on the other side of those words. They're not people anymore. They're just words attached to maybe a picture. 
But this was all rather driven home for me in a conversation that I got into on Facebook. Now, I always like to use examples. And as most of my regular viewers know, I am a big science fiction fan. I'm in particular a fan of Star Trek. And so I'm going to use that as an example. Now, for those of you that aren't Star Trek fans, I urge you to sit through and watch this because you're going to be really amazed at what the controversy that I'm about to spell out to you is. What I'd like to you do is use Star Trek as an example because it seems to me very stark, both for people who are fans and for people who are not fans. I think it's a stark contrast in terms of, you know, in terms of what the argument is, why it's kind of silly, and how we can come to a middle ground that I think everybody could get on board with and be okay with and eliminate the entire problem that's going on now. So to explain this issue for the benefits of non-science fiction or Star Trek fans, for the longest time, from 2000, 1966 rather to 2005, all of the Star Trek that you ever saw was part of a shared universe. You think Marvel did it? No, no, no. Star Trek did it, and they weren't even the first. Dragnet did it, the first that I'm aware of. There was an entire series of shows that started with Dragnet in the late 1940s on radio that occurred inside of a shared universe that continued all the way up through the 1970s. They were all in a shared universe. Jack Webb with Dragnet did it long before they did it with the MCU, and Star Trek didn't get into it until the 1980s. So that was a shared universe. Anything you saw on TV or in films from 1966 to 2005 was part of a shared universe. And there were occasional crossovers, although certainly nothing like the giant crossovers we see in the MCU. Those are planned, where Star Trek's crossovers tended to be uh, and things that would happen at given particular uh, you know, times where it sort of makes sense. Then there was a split, and this split occurred because of rights, intellectual property rights. This happened because... Up until 2005, Star Trek was owned by Paramount Pictures, which was owned in turn by Viacom. Viacom split into two companies. It split into the CBS Corporation and Viacom. And Viacom continued to own a Paramount, where CBS owned uh, uh, just CBS and other properties. But one thing that got sent over to CBS in the split was all of the Star Trek TV shows. So they own the rights to Star Trek television, whereas the people over at Paramount own rights to the movies. But the problem was Paramount can no longer make new movies, or certainly not TV shows, without getting a license from their sister company, CBS First. Now, this is all very complex and twisted. When you really get into it, it's just so bizarre and mind-boggling that I'm going to there's a link down below for a video by a guy named Midnight's Edge, and Midnight's Edge does a really good job of explaining just how fracked up these rights really are. But as a consequence of doing these rights, what that meant was if, Star if Paramount wanted to make another Star Trek movie like they did in 2009, that means they had to get a license from CBS in order to do so. And not only that, whatever they made had to be some percentage and nobody's quite sure what it is. It's probably 25%-ish. Different than what had gone on before in the shared universe. Well, that put Star Trek into a weird position. It was no longer a shared universe. And so what they chose to do with that was to essentially remake Star Trek, the original series, but from the perspective of 2009 and 2009 technologies and what we could see looking forward is what we thought the future might be like in 300 years, 200 years. And then it got worse. Then it got worse because CBS decided to come out with their own Star Trek, Star Trek Discovery, which again has to be different enough from the original source material that it doesn't cross these intellectual property lines. The problem is that no matter how anyone tries to put it, Star Trek Discovery cannot be reconciled with the shared universe. It simply can't. There are too many radical differences between these two programs and these two universes to be able to match them up. They cannot 
fit together. It's just impossible. And no matter what anybody who likes Star Trek Discovery says, and I'm not one of those people, uh, no matter what they say, there is no way that these things can match up. And this has caused an enormous amount of screaming back and forth. You would not believe, if you are not a fan of this show or this series or this franchise, you would not believe. There are people who have gotten death threats over this. YouTubers who have gotten death threats because they are critics of Star Trek Discovery. By the way, they are not haters. Hater is an inaccurate term. That was something that came up within the last 10 years, and it's wrong. It's not haters. I do not like Star Trek Discovery. I'm a very big critic of Star Trek Discovery on many levels, but I'm not a hater. Hating something is an emotion that I and other critics of this show do not have. We do not hate this show. We are critical of this show, and it is inaccurate to ever refer to us as haters, and in fact, it's usually inaccurate to refer to almost anyone who doesn't like something that you happen to like as a hater. They're not haters, they're critics of it. They have some reason that they don't like it. And there's nothing wrong with not liking something. There's absolutely nothing wrong with not liking something. That's fine. And it's also, there's nothing wrong with making fun of it a little bit. I refer to Star Trek Discovery as STD. Because I don't like it. I don't like it. And hey, if Paramount's, I'm sorry, CBS is dumb enough to come up with an acronym that translates to SDD, I'm going to use it. But I was recently admonished, and this is what pushed me to make this video at all. I was recently admonished by someone who likes Star Trek Discovery that I should not be using that. I should be calling it D, I think it's DSC or DISC. I'm not sure as an acronym. And if I wasn't, that I was being disrespectful to that series, I was being childish, and I was being disrespectful to the franchise as a whole. Now, I have to tell you, I am old enough that I watched Star Trek when it ran, first ran, on NBC back in the 1960s. In fact, it has a very special place in my heart and my life for a number of reasons. I'm not going to go into it. I'm a huge fan of the franchise. It is not disrespectful of the franchise simply to dislike this one program. Nor should I be hamstrung by some authority figure's idea of what I should be calling this show. I don't like it. I want to insult it. I want to be disrespectful to it. So I call it STD. There's nothing wrong with that. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. Look at other places. Look at other things, right? People who are fans of sports, you know, football fans, well, they have lots and lots of ways to be disrespectful to teams who are playing against their own favorite team. This is not new. This is not new in the slightest. If you look over at Star Wars fans, they have many, many ways to be disrespectful to various aspects of Star Wars that they dislike. This is not new. No one should be hamstrung about what they can say based on what CBS tells them they have to say. And it doesn't mean anything except that I don't like this show. That's all it means. But there has been a massive split because of this rights issue. Because CBS owns part of it. Paramount owns part of it. They all have to be a little bit different. And none of them bear any resemblance whatsoever to the original Star Trek shared universe as we saw from 1966 to 2005. So what I'm going to do is walk through this basic problem and show you how you can resolve this in a civil fashion. And I would like to say that there are probably many other ways in many other subjects, particularly politics, where you can resolve something in a civil fashion. You can find a middle ground of some kind that most everyone can agree on. You don't have to assume that the person who held a different view than you represents an existential crisis that must be destroyed. Otherwise, you yourself will be destroyed. So I'm going to walk through this. I'm going to walk through sort of the history of this franchise, where the splits happen, and why it is that fans get so irate about it. So to start with, there are multiple universes in Star Trek. This is something Star Trek has always done. It ascribes to something called the many worlds theory. And that is 
that there are many, many alternate universes, some of which are very similar to ours, some of which can be very, very different. In fact, according to quantum theory, if you want to get down this low, there is a different alternate universe where, say, it differs from ours only by the spin of one electron somewhere in the utter vastness of the universe. Now there are also, so these are, these are a whole series of universes that if you went from one to the other, you would not know the difference whatsoever between our universe and it. There are universes, theoretically at least, that would be radically different from ours. And this is what Star Trek has always embraced. So I want to start out here from the alternate universe theory, the many worlds theory, which Star Trek uh, adheres to, with our universe. This is the universe that you and I inhabit. This is the universe where our history leads up to the present time of whenever you're watching this video. We know what happened then. We do not know what happens in the future. We have no idea about that. But this is our universe, the one that you and I inhabit. In terms of Star Trek, there has, from 1966 to 2005, been a shared universe. That is the TV series Star Trek, the original one. The uh, although can this, can the, the sharedness of this has always been debated by fans, the uh, 1970s Star Trek, the animated series, a series of movies that were based around those characters, Star Trek, the motion picture, Star Trek II, the Wrath of Khan, Star Trek III, the search for Spock, Star Trek IV, the voyage home, Star Trek V, the final frontier, and uh, Star Trek VI, the undiscovered country. And there have also been TV series made in another era of that. Star Trek The Next Generation, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, several films, Star Trek Generations, Star Trek First Contact, Star Trek Insurrection, and Star Trek Nemesis, and a Star Trek Voyager, as well as one prequel that occurs before the Star Trek original series called Star Trek Enterprise. These are all in what I call a shared universe. I no longer can refer to it as canon for a variety of reasons, but is a shared universe. This was before... Marvel did it. Star Trek had done it starting back in 1966. Now, most fans want to approach this shared universe as something that exists in our future. I radically disagree. I would say that this shared universe is an alternate universe of its own because there are things that have happened in our universe that did not happen in Star Trek and vice versa. I would say that this universe's history is identical to ours until you get to the year 1964, when Gene Roddenberry first started working on Star Trek as a TV series. Because in the shared universe, Star Trek is not a TV series. It splits in 1964. Its history is identical to ours up until 1964. And that is why if you look at the technology, even today, of the most recent Star Trek movies and TV series, it looks dated. And that's for one very, very simple reason. Futurists of the 1960s and 1964 could not envision the breakthroughs that we would see in information technology. In the shared Star Trek universe, they did not see those breakthroughs in information technology. They were much, much slower to come along. And that's because futurists, the difference between the Star Trek uh, shared universe and ours is that they saw massive increases in power that led to significantly more space exploration than we got. This splits in 1964. And the reason that we see what we do in the shared universe in terms of technology is because in the 1960s, our best futurists, our best science fiction authors, could not envision of a computer smaller than a, the size of a warehouse because that's what they were back then. What they thought was going to happen was that we would see widespread nuclear power and this would lead to ever increasing better and better power generation. That wasn't what we got. What we got was massive breakthroughs in IT. And so that's when you look at all of these series, you see the IT and it looks rather primitive. Again, it's because futurists of that time could not conceive of IT breakthroughs. They conceived of power breakthroughs. And that's why I say that this universe, the shared universe, splits at ours in 1964, as the day that Gene Roddenberry, who created this, decided to start working on Star Trek, the original series. And so we have all of these things in the shared universe that occur where it's split 
in 1964. It is not our universe. It never will be our universe. No science fiction will ever be our universe. Then we get to the mirror universe. This is something that we saw in uh, first in Star Trek, the original series, then in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and later in Star Trek Enterprise. This is essentially a universe made up of bad guys. You know, our characters that we are used to seeing in the Star Trek series, but bad guys. There is no federation in this universe. There is an empire, and they are mean and nasty and horrible and all kinds of evil things. But fans first saw this in Star Trek, the original series. It was seen in later Star Trek series. And we have always referred to this as simply the mirror universe. Then, due to rights issues, we come to our Kelvin universe. Now, this universe is typically said to have started at a couple of specific points that I'm going to talk about, have split off from not our universe, but from the shared universe at a couple of specific points. But I'm going to argue that that's not the case. The Kelvin universe shows us uh, a future with a lot more advanced information technology as well as power generation. I would say that this universe actually split off in 2009. This universe is what the people in 2009, the futurists of that era 10 years ago, were looking forward from. They were saying, okay, if we look at what's come up to 2009, what does the future look like? from that perspective, not from the 1964 perspective, but from the 2009 perspective. So I would say the Kelvin timeline actually begins when it split off in 2009, the moment that J.J. Abrams started working on the first of those three Star Trek movies. And this is the universe that we see in the movie Star Trek, Star Trek Into Darkness, and Star Trek Beyond. There have, however, been crossovers now, this is totally independent of the rights. This is how you can, as a fan, make sense of how stuff went on. There were crossovers from the shared universe that we saw in the first Star Trek movie. Now, most people try to put this and say that uh, the Kelvin universe was the same as the shared universe up until a couple of key points. You'll notice on the far right of the graph on the shared universe side, there is an event in 2387 called the destruction of Romulus. Romulus, if you don't know, was the seat of the Romulan Empire and was one of the Federation's big bad guys throughout the entire 200 years of its history in the shared universe. At that point, Romulus was destroyed, and in an effort to save it, uh, Spock and uh, the antagonist of uh, the uh, first Star Trek film went back in time. Now, most people like to say they went back in time to a point in the shared universe, at which point it split off into an alternate universe. But I believe that is not the case. I would say, again, the Telvin Kelvin timeline begins in 2009. Shared universe started in 1964. And in 2387, those characters went not only backwards in time, but also sideways in time to the Kelvin universe. And they arrived, Nero arrived in 2235, 23 rather, and Spock arrived in 2258. It was not a movement backwards along their own universe. It was a movement backwards in time and sideways in time to the Kelvin universe. That's how you can explain that, regardless of rights. The rights issue makes this a whole lot thornier. But if you're just a fan looking at it from that perspective, this is a way that you can resolve it. Then we get to the part that is most contentious at this point in time with Star Trek fans, and that is what I am calling the Discovery Universe. This is a universe that, unlike the shared universe and unlike the Kelvin universe, did not begin in 1964 nor in 2008 but rather in 2017, when Star Trek Discovery first aired. And that is because there are significant differences in the level of information technology and some of the propulsion technology that we see in Star Trek Discovery that is irreconcilable with neither the shared universe nor the Kelvin universe. It is simply irreconcilable. For those of you who believe, as the producers of Star Trek Discovery have said, that Star Trek Discovery is a prequel to Star Trek the original series, I have to tell you, no, no, that's just not possible. There are too many radically different things that we see in Star Trek Discovery that it cannot possibly fit 
in the shared universe. It might fit a little bit better in the Kelvin universe, but honestly, I don't think so. So Star Trek The Discovery Universe begins in 2017. That is, the, the history of that universe is identical to our universe up until 2017 when that show started airing. And this Discovery Universe we have only seen on Star Trek Discovery. Now, as you recall, there was a mirror universe to the original timeline. And I'd also mention that this, uh, their shared universe, rather. I would also mention that we do not know at what point this shared universe split off from our own. We clearly share some kind of common background with it, but the point at which it split off from our own is totally unknown. Discovery also has a mirror universe that we saw in the first season of Star Trek Discovery. And again, with this one, we have no idea where it split off from our own. This is not the same mirror universe that was mirror to the shared universe. Because, again, there are radical differences in this mirror universe that cannot be reconciled with the shared universe. It's just impossible. And I can point you to many, many different areas where this is true. So we, I call this one the Discovery Mirror Universe. It is a mirror universe to Star Trek Discovery. And again, we have seen this in the, episode, in the first season of Star Trek Discovery. And again, we do not know at which point this diverged from our own universe. It appears to share something common in the far past, but we don't know. We simply don't know where that thing starts. So this mirror universe also exists, but it is a mirror to the Discovery universe and not a mirror to the shared universe. And that is how you can, if you wish to adopt that, this is how you can resolve all of these issues that we are seeing that we currently think of as serious disagreements and existential disagreements about a TV series, for God's sake. This is how we can resolve all that. This is how we can do so in a civil way. We just say, acknowledge, yes, you know, these things don't fit. Sometimes these universes are like trying to put a square peg in a round hole and they no longer fit the shared universe. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Now, it may be as we go along and see more of these series, and these, we may discover that events that happened in the shared universe were similar to or maybe identical to events that happened in back of, like, say, Discovery. But, or maybe some adventures that we saw in the original series happened in Star Trek, uh, uh, the Kelvin universe. But it means that those who create those things are totally freed from any necessity of doing exactly what the shared universe did. They can do anything that they want to, and that isn't a bad thing. You know, I, despite the fact that I don't like Discovery, I am a critic of Discovery, it's not a bad thing for them to be able to do what they want to do with this universe. That's how we can do this in a civil fashion, and that's just with the TV series. We can find civil ways to resolve our disagreements, whether it be politics, whether it be sociology, we can find a common ground that will allow us to say, we will agree to disagree. That is a concept that's totally lost from our modern lexicon. It used to be if you disagreed with someone, and it was a person that you knew, not just words on a screen attached to a picture, you could say to them, well, I disagree with you. We'll just have to agree to disagree. And in fact, in the best form of that, we say, I disagree with what you say, but I will fight to the death to defend your right to say it. Both of these have now disappeared from the public lexicon in favor of assuming that the other person on the other side of those words, whom you don't know, you don't know the slightest thing about their lives, you just see their words, represents an existential threat to you. And that's why social media is destroying civilization. Just look at what it's done to the muckety-muck surrounding the rights to Star Trek. It is destroying civilization. It is destroying our ability to be civil with one another. As a device, going forward, if you're watching me, my advice is first off, remember that what you're looking at on the screen is not the person. The person is something totally different than that. 
their words are not adequate to describe who they are as people. Their positions on anything, particularly a television show, are not adequate to describe who that individual is. Keep that in mind. Secondly, look for the common ground. Look for where you can be civil in making these disagreements. Look for that common ground, as I have attempted to do here. We can, if we like, accept this idea that I've thrown out there, and Star Trek fans can all get on board with it if they want to, and we can all live a peaceful, happy existence, knowing that some of us dislike a program, some of us like it, and there's nothing wrong with that. We can do the same thing in politics. We can say, some of us want to do this, and some of us want to do that, and it's not because we hate each other. And it's not because we see each other as existential threats that must be stamped out for the sake of our own survival. We always have to look at everyone else as they have disagreements with me. But their disagreements are because they think that they are going to do something good by it. They're not out there to try to hurt people. They're just doing the best they can. And the way that they think the best they can is different than yours. And it may be that if you sit down and talk to them as human beings, not just words on a screen, you may discover that there is common ground that you have. Or where you don't have common ground, you can simply say, well, I disagree with you. We'll have to agree to disagree. I disagree with what you have to say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. That, I think, is all that I have to say about that for today. So if you like what I'm doing, please like, sub, hit the notification bell, tell all your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. And if you like what I'm doing, please do support me. You can find a link in my description box below for both my subscribe star account and my PayPal tip jar, as well as a link to my website where you can find other ways to support me, largely through an Amazon wish list that I have. So I would say thank you very much for watching me. Thank you for supporting me if you are doing so. And again, tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock about me. And that would be the end of another Tales from SYL Ranch, news and commentary from the heartland. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.